Good morning. Good morning. Welcome this morning. And um, wow. There was a Presbyterian minister years ago that I heard who was a very godly man. And he called these kinds of moments a holy hush. Where you feel like, it's almost like when, when were you ever given medication and then you're waiting for it to kick in and then it kicks in and you're like, wow, like that. But except God is kind of like just quiet your spirit. And he says, I just want to settle you down and work on you, to work on your heart. Because we are so fever pitch in our culture, we're always moving, always on, that it becomes so exhausting after a while. And I think sometimes God has to just stop us. And some of us, he stops us dead, you know, by, you know, when we end up like with, a, you know, an injury or something, you know, I just want to slow you down. <laughs> just get your attention. And, um, but uh, these kinds of mornings, I feel like just stepping into a river and just kind of flowing with what God is doing. And we've been talking about this, this month, the idea of seeking God. And last week we talked about a question. Do you live out of a vision of God? Meaning, do you... Do you serve God not based on what you see Christian culture do or what you see um, in church, but based on your own vision of him? Not that you've seen him with your eyes, but where you've had an encounter with him in your life. And that's what I mean by a vision of God. And this is one of my life messages. It was one of the very first ones I got as, as a kid. And I didn't even know what it was. But I only knew one thing, that God longs for us to know him. And as I was worshiping today, I just felt like, like uh, thinking about the book of the Song of Solomon, where the bride-to-be is, keeps kind of rejecting him, you know, like, she's like, well, I sort of love him, but, you know, he loves me, he loves me not, so, you know, you know that, that whole idea. And she was fickle in her love. And she, she was on one day and off the other day with love. And what she didn't know was that his greatest longing for her was to satisfy her, was to give her joy and satisfaction. Just the way when a couple comes together, their wedding day and wedding night, it's, it's for satisfaction, it's for, it's for the rest of your life, it's a beautiful thing. But part of us, as human beings, still wants to cling to anything that is less than God, and anything that really appears to satisfy and for the moment it gives a jolt but it never lasts in fact it leaves you more empty than before doesn't it and let's face it we've all done it it's not it's not beyond me or anybody i don't think you know and that's the message i think god is trying to share us he doesn't want you to seek him so that he can just show you all all your stuff and how awful you are that's not his purpose his purpose is to satisfy you. And in that process, you're going to see some things, but he will deal with those things as he goes. So I want to read this scripture to you and kind of weave this in today, what we're sharing today. Isaiah 6, 7 and 8. We, we read the first six verses last week, or, or the first uh, few verses last week. I can't remember where we stopped, but we, we talked about that question, do you have a vision of God? And today... Is, 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 this, is this comment, revelation demands a response. It's impossible to see something urgent in your life. It's impossible to see your house on fire without feeling the urgency to do something about it. And how do you know a Christian is not living urgently? Well, they don't see the fire. They don't see the crisis. They think that everything is just, uh, you know, kind of hum, you know, hum, hunky-dory and, you know, we're just kind of copacetic. And so Isaiah is hit with this vision. And here's his response. He says, and I said, woe is me. I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, 
and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king. Let me just stop there and say that when you see God, I mean a vision of God, it's the same reaction you get except a million times worse. You ever notice, all right, here's, here's my illustration for today. You ever compare yourself to somebody else if you haven't, something's wrong with you, because we've all done it, right? If you're a man, maybe you look at another man, he's stronger than me, he's better built, whatever, or, or he has a bigger truck than me, or you know, a better job, better career. If you're a woman, you might say, well, she's prettier than me, or you know, she has a, a better career. You ever notice when you compare yourself to someone else who you think is up here, how do you feel? You feel awful, you feel like a loser, you feel like, I got nothing, I've, I've accomplished nothing, who am I? Now imagine, all of a sudden, you get a vision of God like Isaiah did, how he feels. Suddenly, he's hit by just how different God is from himself. And something hits him that never hit him before, because he, he, he was a prophet. He was always prophesying about God, but he had never really seen God till now. Because he says it, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Something shifted in his relationship, and God is saying, I'm, I'm bringing you to a deeper place. So I'll read on. He says, My eyes have seen the king and the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs, a seraphs are powerful beings that are in God's presence, and, and they exist to worship God. They flew to me holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongues. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. See, God doesn't let us dwell on it. He just says, okay, let's deal with it now. And then he says, then I heard a voice, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Let me say this morning that we not only need a revelation of God in our life to live by, and maybe you grew up in church, and did you know that one of the reasons why it's important to evaluate your life always in Christ, to make sure you're on track, is because uh, there was a statistic that showed that in the Bible, people who failed, people who fell at the end, always fell, almost always fell at the latter half of their life not at the first half of their life. So the older you get, you have to be more careful than ever because certain things settle in your life and you have to decide, is this the person I'm going to be the rest of my life or am I going to let God keep challenging me and keep calling me out on things and keep making me grow and keep making me move forward? But first, what is Revelation. We've been talking about, well, you need a revelation. What is that? Is it some cosmic thing that's floating in the air? No, revelation is very practical. And I'll just give you three forms of revelation this morning real quick. Revelation is first God making himself known through his word. That is the primary way that God reveals himself, through the Bible. So if you're not reading your Bible, you're not really getting revelation and that's why it's so dangerous that if you get your cues from Christian culture or even from, you know, watching a YouTube, that's, oh, that's okay to a point. But you need to get your revelation, your primary revelation from the Word of God. Because you cannot help but be shaped by the Word that you read. It's easy to dismiss a sermon or a podcast or a video. But when you read the Word of God, it is the ultimate mirror against your life. So this way of thinking is what fueled many, many missionary journeys where they said, well, we have to get people to, to hear the word of God, to hear the gospel. But there are other ways that God reveals himself to us as well. God re reveals himself through creation. Those of you who love nature, the nature God created, have you ever actually felt God's presence when you were out there? It's a beautiful thing. And I'm, from, I'm a city boy, but I love going to Letchworth State Park, which is an hour and a half away, and just walking through there and taking pictures. It's amazing how beautiful it is, and to know that God created it. 
But this kind of encounter happens by experiencing the sights and smells and sounds of God's creation. And just to see a little rabbit run across, you know, it's so beautiful. And there's something in it that, that screams to us, there's more than just random chance that created this. That's creation. And that's why Romans 1.20 says, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that are made. Those things that are, are made are a hint that God's power and divine nature are flowing through them. And he's speaking to us through nature. But then the third way, which is what Isaiah encountered, is when God shows himself to us by encountering us. And that's what we all need as believers, as followers of Christ. We need seasons in our life where we get encounters of God. And sometimes you get an encounter and it may last for years. And then God says it's time for a new one because sometimes the old one kind of becomes a little stale and you become used to that revelation. But God reveals himself through his power and his presence in the world. He reveals himself through healing and through miracles and through showing up and through visions and dreams. That's the power of God. That's what I mean by encounter. And we all need this kind of revelation in our life. In the book of Acts, there was a demonstration of God's power. When the church was born, the church was born by this kind of encounter. It wasn't born because someone said, let's read the Torah the church is born. It was born because the Holy Spirit revealed himself the way Jesus promised in acts of power. It says in Acts 2, 5, now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, meaning the sound of people speaking in tongues, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Think about this. That is a move of God. When people hear the gospel in their own language, that's amazing. And then in Acts 2.11, it says, we, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? That's what I mean by having an encounter with God. When you have an encounter with God, you, you cannot control it. You can't just put it in a box and put a bow on it and say, I have that. No, no, it has you. It has you by the tail, and, and there's nothing you can do about it <laughs> but surrender. It changes you. It changes you. And that's part of the struggle of all of us. I've seen it in my own life where, where you see a bad habit in your life or something you're doing that you want to break, and you try to do it in your own power. Or you try to do it by a resolution at the end of the year. This is the year coming. I'm going to do this. But just one glimpse of him, and you'll change. Because when you see the satisfaction he gives you, and the power he gives you, and the grace he gives you, you'll sell everything you have just to get that. There's nothing you wouldn't give up to, to, to get that again. That's why Paul said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the, sh and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. Think about Paul. He, he was a successful intellectual. He was, he was mentored by a famous philosopher named Gamaliel. And he was a genius by all standards. He had degrees. He had uh, respect from, from the, the most difficult Pharisees and Sadducees and all these people. And yet he counted all that nothing to know Christ. Nothing. Because he had a glimpse of it. He had a vision of God. It wasn't a vision of synagogue or church or of, of what Christians were doing. It was, it was his own encounter with God that transformed him. Now, Billy Sunday, true story, he was once witnessing to a, a drunk man who was laying on a park bench, and he asked the man, are you saved? And the man responded with a, a slurring voice, of course, I'm, I'm a convert of yours. I'm a convert of yours, Mr. Sunday. And then Billy Sunday says, that's right. You must be a convert of mine because you're certainly not a convert of Jesus. 
What was he saying to the man? The man had, had a revelation of Billy Sunday, but not of Jesus. And I'm afraid that how many Christians are getting a revelation of, of people they follow online? Which, it can be good if you have a revelation of Jesus. But if that's all you're getting, you're, you're missing 90% of God. Because God wants you to have so much more than you have. Why do so many people walk away from God? It is likely that they walk away from God because they had a revelation of anything but Jesus. Maybe they, they said, oh, I just love how you know, they used to sing 20 years ago. and I love that. And I do too. I love the old way, but God always does new things. And God isn't there anymore. He's here now. Or maybe someone said, well, I said the sinner's prayer, and that was their idea of revelation of Jesus. But they never really changed their life. They never really obeyed and surrendered their life to him. Or maybe they got locked into Christian values. I, I know people who don't know Jesus who love Christian values. Because they make sense to them. They're like, that makes perfect sense. And we're like, all you need is Jesus. And you're good to go. Or maybe they got human traditions where church, the way of doing church became an idol to them, a golden calf. And the problem was that since Jesus was never their template, what reason would they have to continue? Because all those things in the end don't satisfy. So then we come to the response of Isaiah. We know the response because he's in front, he's in the presence of the God of the universe, the creator of the, of the universe. I, mean, I can't imagine that scene. So the scene goes from holy, holy, holy to woe is me. And the word woe has, has more than one meaning, but there it, it really means I, I am. I'm speechless. I, I'm, I'm undone. I don't know what to do. I'm lost. He says, woe is me. I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Once you've seen God, you have to make a decision. Is my life going to continue the way it is in nominalism, in, in maybe half-hearted Christianity, in busy, busy, busy all the time and never praying, never, never knowing God? Or am I really going to begin making time for him? We all know that whatever is important, you will make time for. That's a fact. And if God is really, really important in my life, I will make time for him. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I have to lay aside. He's the only relationship that really gives me life. Everything else drains me. You ever notice that? You go to work, you're drained. You deal with people all day, you're drained. Some of you deal with people all day. You get home, you don't want to talk to anybody because you're drained. Only God can replenish you. Only God can refill you. So Isaiah was dazed and dumbstruck. He just, he didn't know what to, he said, I, I have no words. And today there was little sense of this kind of feeling of being dazed and dumbstruck because I, I, I feel like we don't really know the awesomeness of God. Or maybe we once did, but maybe we, we've forgotten it. And Isaiah was stuck, he was struck by, by God's radical otherness. And that's a fancy term, but I kind of touched on it earlier that, that it's when you compare yourself to someone who's so different than you that you can't even begin to comprehend what they even are or what this is. Think about an ant climbing on your counter. Every spring we get that, right? The ant's trying to climb on the counter looking for your sugar. Imagine if you, if you stooped down and tried to explain to the ant why they can't do that? Why you don't want that? That would be absurd because you transcend that ant by a million miles. That's how Isaiah felt before God. He felt God transcending him 
so, until, uh, so far that he's like, all I can do is just hunker down here. And that's what radical otherness is. Radical otherness is the parts of God that are shrouded in the unknown. So different than us, so extreme, even offensive, that all we can do is bow down and remain silent. Have you ever been offended at God or angry at God? And you realize that you're just really being a child in a way. Because you're being angry at the parts you really don't know or understand. Have you ever seen someone condemn God because of something that happened or didn't happen in their life? And they're bitter against God. And they made angry, snap judgments about the unknowable parts of God. That's because encountering God, his radical otherness, encountering that part of him you don't understand, without a vision of God, without, without intimate relationship with God, always leads to outrage. But on the other hand, I've seen people and known Christians who went through hell on earth in their life. And you feel sorry for them and you, you pity them. And God is like, don't pity them. They have more victory than you. They have more joy than you. Because they, they love me through it. They know me through it because they've seen me. Yes, yes. And like Job, they say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Why? Because Job had a vision of God. He knew God. He didn't just read books about God. He knew God for himself. And everyone in this room, everyone online who's, who's watching me, you can have a vision of God. Because God created you for a relationship. We're made for a relationship. And that, that's especially for you men who think you're Clint Eastwood. You are made to touch God. And you are made to be touched of God. You're made to enjoy intimacy in God. In your own way, in, with your personality, however that is. But then comes the problem. He encounters God and he realizes, I am so messed up. I am so lost. And then he realizes he has unclean lips. What does this mean? Growing up, I would always read this because it's one of my favorite scriptures. And I know I say that a lot, but I, I really like the word. But I like the scripture because, because it, it talks about encounter. But I always felt and thought growing up that this scripture meant, unclean lips meant he was a gossip. So God is judging you and the whole nation because you're gossips? I don't think so. There's more to this. A lot more to this. Think about what we talked about previously on this. King Uzziah, the year that King Uzziah died, that's how the scripture begins. He says, I saw the Lord. It seemed like the heavens opened the minute this king dies. Because the king, because of his actions, had put a chokehold on the move of God and the prophetic in the country. And he had presumptuously barged into the temple and tried to offer incense. A duty that was reserved just for the priests. And because of this, something, it, it, it put a damper on God's movements in the country. Just the way evil always does. And so because of what King Uzziah had in pride done in limiting and hobbling the prophetic, it is very possible that Isaiah's unclean lips were due because they had become silent. Not because of what they said. They had become silent about his own sins and about the sins of the people. Does that make sense this morning? Sometimes the perversion of our mouth isn't by what we say, but it's what, what we fail to say in love, in truth and love to people. I'm not saying go to people and, and start pointing your finger at them. No, no. We, we do this with humility and love. The Bible is very specific with speaking the truth in love. And we live in a day where, where we must not be afraid to speak the truth in love. We must take a stand in him 
no matter what the world does. And so Isaiah's sin was the sin of silence. And the people's sins were the sins of silence. Church Father Jerome said, we may refrain from every type of sin, but if we keep silent about the truth, we are certainly committing a sin. Now I'm not saying go to work tomorrow, go to school tomorrow and start telling people off. But I'm saying, Lord, show me wisdom. That if, if, there's, a, if there's a God moment, if, if, there's a, if there's an opportunity, Lord, to share, I'm not going to hide the light from people. But I will share the truth. And then came the cleansing. Remember, God, you know, when we see God, God doesn't have to point out our elephant. We already see it because when you to, to see God is to see yourself. To see how other than him you are. And how different from him you are. But he shows us that elephant in the room, not so that he can condemn us and so that he could, you know, look at us like some, some mean person just wanting to put us down, but so that he can cleanse it away because he wants to have a relationship. So Isaiah 6, 7 says, the seraph touched my mouth with it, meaning the coal, the live coal, and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And we know that there's something about fire in the scriptures. There's a lot of themes about fire in the scriptures, about burning out our sins. And in God's presence, since God is a consuming fire, it's impossible to be in his presence and hate your brother or sister. It's, about, it's impossible to be in his presence and gossip about somebody and criticize somebody and condemn somebody. It's impossible to have that kind of revelation and 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 do wrong by your spouse. Because once you've seen him, you either become a reprobate or, or you become a believer, a true believer. See why it's not about going to church, even though we should assemble, but it's about knowing him. He wants us to know him. So the lips, our lips are the organ of confession. God can't cleanse away but I don't confess. That's why it's important that we confess our sins to him, that we hear ourselves saying those sins before him so that he can cleanse them because you have to own them before you release them. A wickening occurs whenever we encounter and respond to God at some point of our unlikeness to Christ, said Robert Mulholland Jr. I'll say it again. A wickening occurs whenever we encounter and respond to God at some point of our unlikeness to Christ. It's when you confront him and he confronts you and you see this, dissim this dissimilarity in yourself. You see your life out of alignment and you say, okay, God, I want to fix that. I want to get this healed up. I want to get this transformed. And then all of a sudden you begin growing from there. This is why we're living in this day a day where we, we must examine ourselves. So then came the commissioning. We're going to pray in a minute here. There came a, a commissioning because God never encounters us so that we can just hug it up for ourselves and become selfish and self-centered and say, uh, I'm going to live for a revival. That's not why God encounters us. He encounters us so that then we can encounter the world around us with his power and his presence and with his encounter. Have you ever met people that when you were near them, you just felt God's presence? You felt his power? That's what I mean. It says they took note that they had been with Jesus. Do people take note that you've been with God? Or do they take note that you've been somewhere else or with, with someone else or with something else? What defines you? What is the ultimate intention of your life? What is the ultimate purpose of your life? It says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Send me. Notice that the commissioning could not happen until God dealt with the elephant in the room. And that couldn't happen until the, he had a revelation of God. It works in pieces. 
And that's why, unless you have a revelation of God and know him for yourself, all you're doing is converting people to be like you. And Jesus talked about that in the scriptures. He talked, you know, the Pharisees were having converts and he says, you know, you're, you're making them twice the son of hell that you are. And he wasn't purposely trying to insult them. He was showing them that you're converting people to yourself, but not to me, not to God. And winning, winning people to Christ is not about me making people like me and saying, behave the way I do. Think exactly the way I do. But it's about leading them, pointing them to God and letting God do the work and me just loving them and helping them through it. Our vision for the lost is directly connected to our vision of God. That's why if I win souls to Christ, it has to be because I know him for myself, because I have my own testimony to share. Even if it's limited, I, I always felt growing up, I didn't have much of a testimony. I grew up in church. And even though I had a little, a little spat where I was you know, running around with gangs a little bit, I, I never smoked or drank or anything. And I was a virgin until I got married, 31 years old, my wife and I. So I'm like, what testimony do I have? <laughs> Maybe that's it. That if God could keep me, He's faithful. So you have a story to tell with your personality and your gift. Even if you're shy, even if you're a little quirky and strange, you have a gift. We all do. We all have something to give. And it's God's job to help you get over your own quirks and your own faults so that you can witness without killing people, without judging them, without driving them off. So God wants to commission you. He wants to awaken you so that you can become salt and light in the world. Because it's impossible to claim that you know God or that I know God and not care about the things that he cares about. Chiefly, chiefly, a broken world. God loves the backslider. He, the Bible says he's married to the backslider. He loves them. He loves them. And did you ever notice in the scriptures that the only people Jesus was ever hard on were church people? And I say church, you know, that's our language, but people from the synagogue. He was only hard on them. And it seems like he was very kind to sinners, to prostitutes, to hypocrites, to people who cheated and stole money. He was very kind and patient with them, but man, when it came to the church people, oh, wow, why is that? Because they claimed to have a revelation of God, and they didn't by the way they lived. And he said, because you say you see, because you say you have revelation, your sin remains. So Isaiah dealt with his own stuff, now he begins to see the world through God's eyes. So Jesus didn't come to meet my personal therapeutic needs. But he came so that the whole world would be transformed by an encounter with him through my life and through your life. That's why he came. He didn't came to be my personal savior. I absolutely abhor that term, personal savior. He's not my personal savior. He's my savior, period. In Christ, revelation meets redemption. And redemption leads to the calling to go into the world. I'm going to close with a quote by John Keith Falconer, who was a man that he caught a vision 
for himself of, of what is God, of, of what God wants to do in the world. And he went to the darkest places. He said, he said, I have but one candle of life to burn, and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a, a land flooded with light. That's how you know you really want to do this. You don't want to just, you know, be a witness to the scuba diving instructor in Aruba. <laughs> but you realize, you know, Lord, I will go wherever you call me. And if that's a place that is, makes me uncomfortable, a place that I, my flesh like, doesn't like it, I will love it because I love you. That's what famous people did, like J. Hudson Taylor. They, he went to China, and he was one of the very first missionaries who began dressing in Chinese clothes so that he can reach out to them. And once he did that, he started winning souls to Christ. And you know that there's a city in China right now, I, I can't remember the name, it was where he lived and where his ministry was. That is one of the most prosperous cities in China. Did you know that? I wonder why. So ask yourself the question this morning. Stand with me. We're going to pray. I want you to ask yourself that question. Am I responding to the revelation God is showing me? Am I really... Am I living out of that revelation? Is it challenging me to the point where I feel like maybe I need to straighten some things out in my life. Maybe I need to clean the leaven out of, of my house. In the Old Testament, they would clean the leaven out during that season. They would go through their house and find anything that had leaven and remove it. And leaven represents sin. Anything that might be an idol, anything that might be a, something that, are, that will make you stumble in God's presence or keep you from him. I want to pray right now. Lord, you see our lives. You see the idols we can have. Not things we bow down to, but maybe in our hearts we regard them and replace you with them. Lord, it could be materialism in our life. It could be stuff. It could be an, an opinion we have on something. It could be our politics. It could be television. It could be social media. It could be something, Lord, something that, that is keeping us from intimate fellowship. Lord, we pray for those online as well as those here. We ask you, give us the courage to remove the leaven from our lives. Give us the courage to remove those things that make us stumble and fall and forgive us. We know that you long for us to be with you. You long to satisfy us with a satisfaction that is beyond anything the world can give. I ask you that you continue to draw us, continue to speak to us, continue to love us, which is a prayer I really don't need to say because you already do. But Lord, I want to thank you for not giving up on us. For that person right now who feels lost, I pray that you, you bring them to a place where they know they are found in you. To that person who feels abandoned, oh God, I pray, show them that you are their father who loves them eternally, no matter what. You accept them, Lord. To that person who feels rejected, Lord, they are accepted in you as they turn to you. So forgive us, Lord, for our sins, but also forgive us for not going to you, for not seeking you out as you have sought us out. So I speak blessing over your people, over those who are watching. And we thank you for your greatness, Lord, and your graciousness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.